Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, this is O'Culture, where we transmit conversations on esoteric art, science, and history at 528 hertz. I am your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. My guest this episode is the Illuminati watcher himself, Mr. Isaac Weishaupt. Isaac and I are going to be talking about his latest book, The Star Wars Conspiracy, Hidden Occult Illuminati Symbolism of Aliens and the New Age. That's coming up in just a moment. But first, I am frustrated. I've had so many issues with technology recently that I just about gave this show up. I recorded four shows all in a row, and they all had the same technical glitch that took me forever to solve, and I don't even know if I found a permanent solution, to be honest. Regardless, I had to re-record all of those shows. Thankfully, the guests were understanding and made more time for me. It was quite inconvenient. Actually, I re-recorded all of them except the one you're about to hear with Isaac. Fortunately, he had a backup recording that he helped clean up so we wouldn't have to re-record. Quality of this show is fine, but you may notice some distortion here and there. Although, I think it adds a rather appropriate effect to the conversation. Some of you may know what I mean when you hear it. What's more, Isaac's a busy dude, I'm a busy dude, so we were relegated to only about 45 minutes for this conversation, and it's my fault because I had to push the time back or else it would have had a little more. So the runtime is a bit shorter than usual, but I think you'll enjoy it either way, Star Wars fan or not, it's pretty compelling subject matter. We're talking George Lucas, Joseph Campbell, Jungian archetypes, the Kabbalistic Tree of Life, and much more. Well, not much more because of the runtime, but you get the point. Anyway, enough of my incessant rambling. Here's my conversation with Isaac Weishaupt about the Star Wars conspiracy. Enjoy. Isaac, what's going on, man? Thanks for being here. Yeah, no worries, man. Thanks for having me on. I like like talking with uh, anybody and everybody about this stuff, whoever wants to listen. Well, I've listened to you on several other uh, podcasts and radio shows. I've read your work for a while now. But for those people who don't know you, could you maybe give us the Cliff Notes version of who you are, what you do, and why you do it? Sure. Uh, So my name, which is a pseudonym, is Isaac Weishaupt. If you look that up, you will find that the founder of the Bavarian Illuminati is Adam Weishaupt. I am of no relation because it is a... (laughs) A poorly chosen pseudonym. It was chosen on a whim many years ago when I started the, uh, the website IlluminatiWatcher.com. And uh, the funny thing is, is, like, I didn't intend for absolutely any of this to happen. So if I would have known what was going to happen with, like, as far as people, you know, listening to my stuff, I would have picked a better name. <laughs> but that's what it is, and that's what I'm stuck with now. As far as what I do, uh, it's evolved into a sort of research project that kind of it kind of changes as time goes by because if you read my first book compared to like my more recent book you'll see that there's like kind of a difference in tone and difference in belief systems there because when I started out I was into conspiracy theories I was into you know trying to understand what the the deal was with the alien agenda who the Illuminati is Uh, And it started out with just being interested in these topics. And what I didn't like was a lot of the theorists that I would listen to always had like a religious Christian angle. Even though I was a Christian, albeit not a good one, I always caveat that statement because I don't want people to look to me for their (laughs) Christian inspiration because that's not me. But I was was raised in in a church and I I go to church as much as I can at this point. But uh, it started out with kind of like a kind of like a research from a scientific perspective where I was like, look, I'm going to pull apart. I'm going to disconnect this Christian angle to this Illuminati stuff. And I'm going to, I'm going to really get down to who this is and what's going on. But, you know, over the course of many years and many books, it seems that that is part and parcel to the entire agenda is to basically destroy our world as we know it and rebuild it in their belief system. Now, you know, we could go into all the ideas of who is the Illuminati and and what do they believe in, but I think most people have a general feel for what that means. Uh, It doesn't necessarily mean that one group from Germany, it's, that's, the term Illuminati has kind of evolved over time. And what, what I've recently been studying a lot of 
besides the alien agenda, is the occult agenda within this Illuminati sort of belief system that they have, because it seems that the two are connected. And uh, that's not to say that I fully understand every aspect of occultism, but I do see a lot of connections to be had there between many of these kind of umbrella groups that we've all considered as part of the Illuminati. And uh, to, you know, to, to, to sum it all up, what I do is on the website IlluminatiWatcher.com, I go through pieces of entertainment, film, music videos, uh, you know, high profile ritual events like the Super Bowl. And I talk about the symbolism that we find in those things and some of the hidden messages that are uh, being relayed to the masses. Because what I believe is that the Illuminati control the entertainment industry and there is kind of a kind of a pervasive mess of message across all of these things that you can pull out. And I'd like to go over that because I feel like that is kind of the best way to reach a larger audience is by finding something relatable without being too heavy on the, the, the factual basis of the, you know, the historical evidence and all that stuff. Like I, I insert that into the arguments and in the books, I go into more kind of that more kind of research angle. But as far as the posts I make on IlluminatiWatcher.com, they're they're a little more easier to digest. You seem well versed and well read in in these types of of subjects. You know, like you said, you're not an expert in the occult, but I wouldn't know that from from reading your stuff. You seem like you've studied it quite a bit, and maybe it's just from you know what you've been doing the last few years with the site. But kudos, man, because I I learned some things about the occult that I didn't know from your latest book. And if you don't mind, I'd like to just go ahead and get right into it. It's called the Star Wars Conspiracy. You know, like you said, you've tackled a bunch of different films and TV shows books to pop culture just in general really so what gave you the idea to turn your eye towards star wars was it something specific was it just the this kind of renewed interest in the franchise or have you been looking at this for a while the the renewed interest in the franchise is probably what drove this book to be written because you know when disney bought this from george lucas for excess of four billion dollars that kind of cued me in to try to research thing a little bit more. I mean, obviously the thing makes just money hand over fist. So there's a, you know, sure there's a rational financial aspect to it. But if you look at a lot of Disney's works, you'll see that they all kind of push different themes of, uh, you know, destruction of the family unit, which falls in line with the Illuminati agenda because in all the films, there's always like the murder of the parents or the, or the death of the parents or even just an absent parent. And in these Star Wars films, you see not only that, but you see sometimes the child is instructed to kill their own parent, which, uh, you know, I don't want to, well, I'm I'm probably going to spoil some plots, but I don't know who hasn't seen all the Star Wars episodes, but you know, in episode seven, you, you see Kylo Ren take out Han Solo, his father. And then in, uh, you know, episode six, Luke is supposed to kill his father and so on and so forth. But yeah, this, this kind of renewed you know, because every year we're going to be hit with another film, it seems. And everywhere you go, you see Star Wars merchandise. It's it's seems to be like kind of the most popular piece of entertainment that exists in our world. I would think so, man. Yeah. And they're definitely going to saturate the fuck out of the market. That's for sure. But yeah, uh, let's go back to the guy who started all this. And let's talk about George Lucas for a moment and the two companies that he founded Lucasfilm and Industrial Light and Magic now, both those companies are located in the Presidio in San Francisco why is this location significant so when you look at the history of uh, you know that area where the Presidio was the Presidio was a, a army military complex and in that complex, back in the 80s, they had a, uh, a daycare center like they do on every military installation. And at this daycare center, there were allegations of child abuse uh, on you know various levels, sexual, physical, all that kind of stuff. And when they researched it, they didn't quite come to a conclusion as to who did what. But part of that investigation included one Lieutenant Colonel Michael Aquino who, if most people are familiar with, he's the guy that started the Temple of Set. He's a pronounced Satanist. And he uses, you know, black magic and, and all this stuff, but he, he was the guy who ran the psychological operations units for the Army, the PSYOPs units that you hear so much about in conspiracy circles now. But yeah, that, to find out that George Lucas's 
Lucasfilm and ILM both are housed inside the what was the Presidio military complex is kind of interesting because if you do a little research on that the uh, research uh, the Presidio child abuse case you'll see a lot of these same kind of odd themes that we we see when we research the uh, the Illuminati. They actually did file charges against someone for that that sexual abuse that uh, what was it Gary Hambright and he right, he was right. quoted as saying. I can't understand why these allegations and falsehood have been directed solely at me, as if there was just a much larger group of people involved, and he couldn't understand why exactly he was the only one being investigated or charged, I guess. Yeah, the uh, it was interesting because Aquino, or Michael Aquino, he uh, thought he, similar to a couple other people I've talked about, he thought he was the uh, next in line to he, like he was the reincarnation of Aleister Crowley, and Aleister Crowley had that infamous quote of uh, talking about how children should be accustomed from infancy to witness every sexual act. Which, you know, I've read some things saying that that's not quite what the literal translation of what he meant was, because he was, you know, he was kind of a uh, what do you call it, kind of like into shocking people. But yeah, it, it, I mean, it's just all kind of like it makes you wonder what is going on, and when you find out that they went ahead and plowed down this uh that daycare center and then moved all this other stuff into the same area it just draws some interesting conclusions sure now before lucas created star wars he made this film called thx 1138 it has a curious plot and some numerological significance could you take us through what thx 1138 is about it's you know it's another one of these dystopian future movies like 1984 brave new world uh, ideas of police states and we see that the numerology if you add up all the digits and the numbers you'll get the t equal to two h equal to nine x equal to six and then you add up the 1138 the 1138 you basically come up with the number three now the number three is important in terms of Illuminati symbolism because of the the use of the triangle, which goes into different ideas where the triangle symbolizes creation, the power of manifestation, and you also see it when magicians do certain rituals. They they call upon demons and they put the demon inside the triangle and that protects them from that demon. And we also see, you know, Jay-Z is a great example. Jay-Z and, and Beyonce, they always do that. You know, it's called the rock diamond, but it's just, it's a triangle symbol that looks identical to what you see a lot of these Satanists and occultists use, like Anton LaVey. You can see images of him doing that. You can see various, I think it's OTO rituals that use that. But anyways, the number three seems to be of importance to the Illuminati, and it's basically another representation of the the triangle or the creative force of manifestation that plays a large role in the star wars story itself do you think that lucas was intentionally putting this messaging out there like you know he wasn't a big deal he wasn't anybody when he made thx 1138 so what's your read on you know maybe the intentionality of all of this yeah i go into that in the book a little bit it's it's almost like there's an inspired guiding force force behind lucas because i don't get the feeling i mean not that i know the guy but from what i've read i don't get the feeling that the guy's got this real nefarious kind of agenda but i wonder if he isn't sort of influenced by a luciferian dark spirit to do what he does because like if you look at the altamont incident and uh, 69 there's that you know the concert where the hell's angels murdered that uh, meredith hunter guy in the crowd you know there's all kinds of stuff behind that that's very strange that mick jagger even talked about how every time they play sympathy for the devil something funny happens because they actually had to stop singing that song because of such uh the fights in the crowd and stuff and they start they moved on to the next song and right away the, that's when the hell's angel uh, killed meredith hunter and then George Lucas was actually filming this for the Rolling Stones documentary, Give Me Shelter. And the only shot of his that made it was the the moon in the background with the mass exodus of people leaving this, what, what turned out to be kind of a horrific version of Woodstock. And many people claim that this was the end of the hippie era, coincided with the Manson murders, of course. Uh, so it seems like maybe there's a kind of a dark angel on Lucas's shoulder. I don't necessarily get the idea that he would be sort of connected in with this Illuminati group, so to speak. 
Uh, but I do feel like he has been inspired somewhat by this, you know, tinge of Luciferianism. Right. So Star Wars itself seems to be based on Joseph Campbell's monomyth, The Hero's Journey, from his Hero with a Thousand Faces. Could you explain this myth in a nutshell to us and how it connects to Star Wars here? Yeah, so if if you go back to like what got me down this kind of path is the ideas presented by psychoanalyst Carl Jung. Carl Jung talks a lot about how symbols talk to us on a subconscious level. They talk to our subconscious mind. Take that idea a little bit further, and you can look at Carl Jung's talk of the the uh, the Jungian archetypes or uh, the primordial images that Plato talked about, and I think Aldous Huxley called them the seeds of consciousness. But basically, they all kind of think there's this kind of kind of buried subconscious belief system or uh, you know alternate version of history that we all have in our minds, which is what actually seems to be echoed very well at Star Wars. You know, tons of people love these films. I myself was also kind of obsessed with them somewhat, but I didn't really understand why. Like, you know, it's 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 okay, like it's good enough, but to me it seems like he found a way to tap into this sort of archetypal realm. And when you read the the uh the work of Joseph Campbell, they seem to go hand in hand with Carl Jung talking about like the psychological aspect of this stuff. So, if you look at Carl Jung, you can see he talks about this hero's journey or or the mono myth is what he calls it and it's this idea that you know almost all characters and all stories go through a similar process uh, a similar cycle where the the protagonist of the film which in, you know in this example Luke Skywalker he is in the ordinary world which is Tatooine in episode 4 because that's, that's the order they were given to us, four, five, six, then one, two, three, then seven. Uh, but the first step is he's in the ordinary world of Tatooine. Then he gets the call to adventure, which in Star Wars is R2-D2 giving Luke the message to save Princess Leia. The next step in Joseph Campbell's monomyth is the refusal of the call, because Luke is afraid to leave his home. Uh, you know, and, and it progresses through a cycle that, you know, you can find... This, uh, you know, just kind of do a Google search for Joseph Campbell, and you'll see pretty much every step of this kind of, I don't know what you want to call it, it it's depicted as a circle, and, and that's the best way of describing it. Every step of this is actually in the Star Wars films, and, and you can apply it to many films. And what I find interesting is the occult tie in that this stuff has, because the initiate. Is going to goes through the same sort of process. They leave the ordinary world. Uh, they get a sequence of of trials. They're put down underground into the belly of the whale, which in Star Wars is depicted as the Death Star. And then they come back up. They kind of resurrect as a new being, enlightened in the new way in the uh, you know in the ancient mystery schools in uh, ancient Egypt. They put the initiate underground underneath the Great Pyramid for three days. And then they they brought them back up. They, they wanted them to face death and think they were literally going to die. Which is what you see in, like, Skull of Bones initiations and stuff like that. The, there's a certain, what they call the road of trials and going into the belly of the whale that they all do. And we, we see that theme in, in many other aspects. Like, I did an article on Beyonce's Lemonade visual albums. Uh, Rihanna, Rihanna had the Anti albums. They all seem to show us this idea of confronting death, confronting what Crowley called the abyss or Corona zone. It's all this idea of kind of getting in touch with this dark side and coming back out the other side, a better being sort of like a hardened piece of steel or a sword through the fire. They come out a, a better sort of alchemically transformed being uh, and Joseph Campbell calls this returning with the boons, and it's the same concept from Prometheus going up to the gods, stealing the fire, and giving it to mankind, which is what ties us into the idea that Star Wars is a Luciferian tale. Right, and I do want to talk about that if we get to it, but I want to make sure that we spend some time here talking about the belief in the story that there is this one-world consciousness, this hidden energy field Obviously, in the film series, it's called The Force. 
do you see this idea of the Force as a threat, then? Well, I mean, depends on your perspective of the thing, right? As a Christian, yeah, I see it as a threat in the sense that people get drawn into this and they would go away from Christianity. And I'm not saying, look, I'm a Christian and I'm right and everyone else is wrong. I'm just saying, you know, as far as that's my team, yeah, (laughs) I'd say it's a threat. Because in all honesty, I was drawn into the New Age movement for a while. And I, I'm not I'm not saying I was like real heavy duty into it, but I had read several books, watched many documentaries, and I found it to be very inspirational. I found it to be in some ways more inspirational than my own church, to be honest, because we, you know, I'm not sure most people are familiar with, with like Christian mass. It's, you know, it's sometimes it gets kind of, it gets kind of boring at times, honestly. And these these new agers are talking about a lot of stuff that's very inspirational and practical and, and modern. So yeah, in, in that sense, I'd say it's a threat, but as far as the force goes and it being another play on this cosmic consciousness, uh, I think it's exactly what, you know, Helena Blavatsky would have wanted, or maybe even Alistair Crowley or even, even Hitler, maybe if we go into him, but Lucas said he wanted to awaken a certain kind of spirituality with the force. And I think his work with star Wars, along with, you know, many other influential films and, and, you know, musicians and new age stuff, it all kind of gets people interested in this idea of God, not being a person, so to speak, but more of a, a vague, you know, cosmic consciousness, as uh, some people called it, or Aldous Huxley called it, the perennial philosophy. And the thing that makes it makes it interesting, and the thing that draws people in, and it's quite nefarious, I believe, is is this idea of like monism. It's this idea that we are all one, we are all connected as this sort of energy field, which uh, in episode four, Obi Wan Kenobi says it's an energy field created by all living things. So it's something that people can easily subscribe to. I don't think they see where that path leads them. I've read uh, Father Seraphim Rose's book about this, and he wrote this back in like the 60s and 70s, where he warned about this idea that the more you kind of dilute the Christian faith and start incorporating many beliefs into one, that's one method of destroying the Christian faith. So to find a a path, like Lucas even said, it, he was trying to find a path that satisfied every religious belief, which is, you know, it's kind of like what Crowley did. Crowley experimented with many uh, belief systems and kind of picked and chose an amalgamation that worked for him, for you know, supposed enlightenment and such. But uh, when you when you look into the the Force and you look into a lot of these more new age concepts of what God is or what the consciousness is, you'll see that they always seem to have the same kind of powers that you find with demonic possession, Uh, like levitation. You see Darth Vader do that. Uh, Divination, mind control, telekinesis, Uh, like, you know, when Obi-Wan says these, these are not the droids you're looking for, that kind of stuff. All this ties into, uh, you know, Blavatsky and Hitler's ideas of this kind of lost race of superhumans. But as far as the Force goes, I, I think it's just another version of this exact story. Yeah, I've seen you be critical of this New Age movement, this uh, this evolution of consciousness that is talked about so much, especially in, in the conspiracy and occult circles now. In the book, you even say that Lucas contributed to this scheme as if it is some sort of nefarious plot to you know draw people down a path that maybe we're not meant to be drawn down. Why do you call it a scheme then? I mean, is it does it really scare you as a Christian, like personally, or do you see this as something that is not good for the race as a whole? On a on a personal note, I I don't get scared by any of this, you know, because I because I am aware of what's going on and I see it. That's not to say that I support support it so much. You know, I want as a Christian, I want everyone to go to heaven. I want everyone to believe what I believe, but like, honestly, like it's hard enough for myself to stay fully committed to my religion, to have faith. Cause I mean, I, I'm probably the worst example because I, you know, I vacillate on my faith. It's hard. It's hard to like believe. Sometimes you, I read stuff and I'm like, man, this is all a scam, but you know, it's just one of those things. There's no way of really proving whether 
you know, Christianity is right or wrong, but I do know by researching a lot of, you know, these occult ideas, I, I do see that there seems to be a coordinated effort. They seem to be sort of bent on destroying Christianity. And I, I think that's because it, it's a very powerful religion, obviously. And, you know, and if it wasn't in, in, in all fairness, if, if Christianity was a very minor religion, I'm, I'm sure they would, they would be more concerned with, you know, Islam or, or something else that was more, more powerful. But I, I think that seems, I mean, if you go through a lot of these, these sort of occultists, they've all, they've all talked about trying to bring, bring down Christianity from Alice Bailey to Blavatsky, you know, obviously Crowley, Jack Parsons, they all were very vocal about their distaste for Christianity so, you know, in my personal perspective, that kind of puts me at odds with them. I was just curious, you know, what, what you thought about that personally. To be honest, I didn't know you were a Christian until you just told me. So I, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't gathered talk about that from reading like, your stuff. I'm yeah, a terrible I mean, example. Speaking of examples, though, since we are short on time, let's just get right to some examples of this, you know, occult symbolism. What are some of the major concepts and themes from the film that reflect our premise here i would say one of the major ones if not the major one would be this idea of a hidden realm on the tree of life called dayot it's, it's sometimes called dayoth and that is obviously a connection to darth vader the, the sith lords always have that darth title and to find that the kabbalah tree of life has a hidden sephiroth called dayoth uh, it, it begs the begs the question of are these two related and when you research a lot of this, you'll find out they they must be. People might wonder, what's the Kabbalah Tree of Life have to do with this? Well, you know, a lot of these, I don't say they're all occultists, but a lot of a lot of the sort of belief systems of these supposed Illuminati people, they all seem to believe in this idea of the Kabbalah Tree of Life, which is the idea that God's thoughts or or emanations are depicted on this Tree of Life, and there's there's several what they call sephirot that the practitioner of this sort of belief system needs to traverse through this tree of life and kind of learn each universal lesson as they move upwards towards the state of becoming God. Now, one option is to cross into this dark hidden realm called Dayoth, and it's kind of a shortcut, so to speak. Uh, Alistair Crowley talked about this. He called it the abyss and and he talked about how if you weren't prepared to enter this realm, you could go insane. But to me, it seems the Illuminati and, and you know many occultists are obsessed with this link between mind and reality because that's what that's what the, ga the name of the game is here. It's they're trying to tap into a creative side, and that's what happens supposedly when you tap into this dark side of Dayoth, and we and you know that that goes into a whole off branch of. Carl Jung and, and alchemy and stuff, which which goes in the book. But so, so what's interesting here is there's a belief in a dark side to this tree of life, which which is depicted in like the Netflix show Stranger Things. They call it the Upside Down. And in terms of uh, Kabbalah, they believe that that is where the fallen angels called the Klepoth exist. Now, what's curious here, and I'm not taking credit for this. This is uh, Freeman Fly talks about this. But in Star Wars, they execute Order 66. And 66 is the, that's the, the code for the 66 fallen angels of the Klepoth. Now, the reason uh, why they, they think they need to go into this dark realm of, of Dayoth or, or the Abyss or whatever you want to call it, is they, much like the mind, they think that they need to kind of overcome their shadow side or the dark side and understand, understand themselves. They want to become enlightened. Alan Watts compared this to a rose coming from manure. Uh, Young and Nietzsche advocated it. They called it uh, like the individuation process. But it's it's another it, the Star Wars tale is another tale of like duality, where they talk about the light and dark side of the Force. These are just kind of more antinomian systems that that allow one to explore the divine and the demonic. Uh, so. It's kind of like white and black magic is sort of akin to what we see with the, the force, with the, the light and the dark. You know, to them, they don't believe that one is quote unquote evil and one is, one is not. That's why they talk about balancing the force. 
Because if you really take a step back and look, why would they destroy the dark side of the force if they wanted to bring true balance? Because if you want to balance, you'd have parts of equal magnitude on, on either side of the spectrum. So they don't want to get rid of the dark side. They want the viewer to understand that the dark side can also be utilized just the same as the light side. It's like, you know, black magic or white magic. Either one gets the job done. You make a point in the book that the behavior of Darth Vader, Anakin Skywalker, and how, you know, while he's represented as evil, obviously identifying with the dark side of the Force, that he still has some attachment to the light, particularly when he saves Luke and destroys the Sith in Episode 6, I believe. And I think your conclusion there was that there is no good or evil, there is no light or dark, and that in this universe, in the Star Wars universe, that they're all the same. Do you think that stands the reason that that's the message in our universe as well, that they're trying to get out there, is that you you have to have evil to understand good yes man that's great you you were right in my mind there because that's exactly where i was going with this yeah anakin and darth vader they are they are the the anti-hero they're the true hero of the story uh, you'll notice like you know there's an obsession with darth vader many people like darth vader uh but you know he's the bad guy why is that well it's because he's not really the bad guy he's he's shown to us as a bad guy but like you said he saves Luke Skywalker. He saves his son. Everyone can identify with that as a, a, a good characteristic. So what the, the entire tale is from episodes one to six, it's showing us that Anakin is a Jedi Knight and the Jedi Knights before him say, look, uh, do not go to the dark side and do not get a family because that's a vulnerability. So what does Anakin do? He, he gets Padme pregnant, gets has a kid and that now he's got a vulnerability. So he ends up going to the dark side in order to try to save them. It's very understandable. I think, I think the audience can sympathize for that. And in fact, when episode I was two or three released, many people were confused when they walked out of the theater because they were groomed from episodes four, five, six, one, and two that, you know, Anakin was this kind of bad Darth Vader character so when they find out that Anakin actually went to the dark side in order to save his family, they thought, well, that's kind of confusing. So it's like the gears are starting to turn right there. But then it all makes sense by the time you get to episode six, where you find out that Anakin was successful in defying the Jedi Knight's former beliefs that having a family, or worse yet, going into this dark side was indeed not a one-way ticket you are able to utilize the dark side and the light side of the force. And in terms of like new age cosmic consciousness talk, that's it's this idea that you can either uh, be in the stream of consciousness or you can step outside. Either way, you can connect or disconnect from, you know, whatever this, this God force is, this energy field. So yeah, to me, it seems like the, the, the reconciliation of opposites here is, uh, you know, it's like that Gnostic belief of merging good with evil, just like the, you know, the process church of the 60s did. They thought Satan and Jesus should be merged together. And it's the idea that there is no good or evil. And there's there just is. There is just the force. Yeah, that's also the goal of alchemy, you know, to combine opposites, male and female, this androgynous Baphomet type persona, I think. Since we're short on time, you know, we just have a few minutes left here. I do want to touch on another part of your book, and that's the alien agenda, the, the ancient astronaut theory that you talk about. How do these ideas connect to the Star Wars universe? Yeah, and this is where things are starting to... I'm doing a lot of research on aliens right now. I got probably three or four books on aliens I'm going through. I, I read a few so far. I'm trying to make sense out of what exactly aliens are, because I believe in, I believe in a physical and a spiritual sort of component to our world. So I don't know if aliens and UFOs are purely one or the other, or maybe they're interdimensional and they can go between the two, but I, I, I do believe that people see these things. I believe people experience these things for sure. I mean, there's enough evidence and testimonies from reliable witnesses that something's going on. And what seems to me is that these things could be demonic entities or fallen angels. Now, why I say that is... I used to watch, I still watch Ancient Aliens, but I talk about this in the book. The Ancient Aliens show is trying to prepare the masses to accept sort of uh, a pseudoscience. 
and and you know all those theorists that you see on the show, almost all of them, not all of them, some of them, most of them, the famous ones, Sukulos, uh, David Childress. There's there's probably one or two more that I talk about in the book. It's certainly not all of them. I don't want to pick on all of them, but there's the the, the big names. They're not educated in archaeology or anthropology or nothing like that, but they're presented as if they do. And that's not to say that you need to have some kind of university education to, you know, research and understand these ideas. I mean, I do it all the time, right? So I'm just saying for the reader to understand that what you're watching on ancient aliens seems a bit fraudulent at times. I've seen enough refuting of the stuff that they say that you get really got to take it with a grain of salt and, and do kind of your own research before you buy into what they say. And, and, and as you know, it's brought to us by Prometheus Entertainment. And again, Prometheus is another version of this this worship of Lucifer. He's the Luciferian character. Uh, but you know, as far as as far as the Star Wars goes and the aliens, uh, you know, you see, you see, there's some ideas that they're showing us actual aliens, gray aliens that like the like the type that Alistair Crowley channeled called Lamb. Uh, Donald Marshall, he's another. Another, I don't know if you want to call him a theorist, but he claims that he is, he goes through sort of like a, I don't know if you call it mind control, but he goes through like these cloning centers and they use what he calls the REM driven consciousness transfer. It's kind of like Avatar. And he claims that the race of aliens you see in episodes two and three, the Kaminoan, are, are the ones that have actually been in contact with, you know, whoever this Illuminati group is, the government, whatever. And it's the same as the ones from Close Encounters of the Third Kind, which one of the first books I had ever read was by Bill Cooper called Behold a Pale Horse. He claims that the story of Close Encounters of the Third Kind was based on real events in the government's Project Sigma. Now, another connection in the Star Wars films is the names of a couple of the aliens, like Eden Vril or Vril Vrakth, because, uh, like many of you probably already know, Hitler had channeled alien technology through Maria Orsic and the Vril Society. So, you know, and when you look further, as I do in the book, you go into these alien races and the Vril Society. Uh, you read Blavatsky's works like Secret Doctrine and Isis Unveiled. And she talks about how there's an energy force that they can channel from these aliens that they believe will unlock superpowers within mankind which you see in uh, Arthur C. Clarke's Childhood's End as well it goes on and on and I think NASA's trying to make us want to contact aliens for the same reason there's this huge thread of just strangeness with this alien obsession and I would believe it's all part of this Illuminati agenda wasn't Childhood's End like a like a sci-fi miniseries or something not too long ago? Yeah, Arthur C. Clarke wrote the book many years ago, and they made the, uh, I think it was like a three-part movie on sci-fi oh, okay. last year. That was pretty fucking creepy, man. <laughs> yeah, it was. Hey, uh, I just got one more question for you, and I just want to speculate just for a moment. Going back to our uh, conversation about balancing the Force, do you think in Episode Eight, The Last Jedi... Do you think Luke is going to complete this sort of transformation where he's going to take this left-hand path now to balance the Force? Man, that's that's an out-there question. I hadn't thought anything of it, to be honest. Yeah, I was curious about that title of The Last Jedi, and uh, that would coincide with this this theory I'm, I'm kind of presenting where they're trying to say that the Force is neither pure light or, or pure dark or needs to have a good or evil. Uh, so maybe, man. I mean, that's... That's pretty brilliant of you to put that together. Well, I don't know if I put that together myself. I'm I'm pretty sure I've read that on Reddit for the last year. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> whatever, man. Yeah, I'll take credit for it. That's yeah, fine. man, <laughs> take it. <laughs> might, might as well. Anyways, hey, man. Like I said, appreciate your time. We could have talked for another three hours about this, but I know you got to run. So tell people where they can keep up with you and your work. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me on. I, I really appreciate it. I like sharing these kind of ideas, and, and I'd love to come back on and we can sit down and try to have a longer talk. It's been crazy lately. I just, I'm, I'm trying to like squeeze in what I can here and there. But uh, as far as people that want to catch up or, or learn more, you know, IlluminatiWatcher.com is my website. From there, you can you can go to a Start Here 
tab at the top and what that'll do is it'll it'll there's a email sign up form and when you sign up for the email you get you know I, I give you kind of like archived articles uh the latest news recent videos I do on my YouTube channel uh I keep I, I keep everyone up to date through the email list primarily and that's mine I don't sell that I don't share that I, if people unsubscribe I just delete them I don't have any interest in trying to like be some kind of money scheme kind of person with that but yeah the email list is the best way if people just want to read books they're all on amazon i've got most of them narrated by myself on audible uh, with the exception of my first book that was narrated by eric burns that's on audible as well i mean i'm kind of all over the place you got facebook twitter uh instagram i'm trying to keep up with all these damn social medias they keep coming out with but god i just it's a lot man who's time for this i hear you man i hear you all right well isaac Vysop. Thanks for your time, man. I really enjoyed the chat and uh, look forward to talking to you again. All right, brother. You too. Thank you. All right. There you have it. My thanks again to Isaac Weishaupt. Check him out on IlluminatiWatcher.com and pick up the Star Wars Conspiracy on Amazon. That's linked in the show notes if you're interested. Man, I really enjoyed this chat despite its abbreviated nature. My apologies again for that. But I thought it made a nice companion piece to the previous episode with Jane Kyle. Jane and I sort of casually touched on Disney and their apparent interest in mind control and propaganda in their films, and here we have Isaac talking about just that, and perhaps Disney's biggest property in Star Wars. Obviously, that's still a fairly recent Disney acquisition, but what better way to get your messages out than through the most popular film series of all time? There's obviously much more to cover here, and I'm going to try to get Isaac back on again soon to record a sequel the Star Wars Conspiracy Episode 2, if you will. And with a guy like Isaac, there's a host of other things we could discuss too. And I have to say, I really admire guys like him for immersing themselves in this subject matter without being tempted by the dark side of the Force, so to speak. That's no easy task, believe me. I mean, this material is not only dense, but it is quite alluring because it puts the power in the hands of the individual and removes the idea of external monotheism. And for someone like Isaac, who identifies as a Christian, for him to approach this material with an open mind and, and not allow it to influence his beliefs, I admire that. Because occult philosophy can be pretty dangerous. But then again, so can religious philosophy. Anyway, that's it for this one. Don't forget to subscribe to or rate the show in iTunes or whatever channel you found it on. Until next time, this is Oculture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Oh.